The last thing you want is for something to go wrong with your plumbing, but it happens a lot. And the last thing you want when there's water spraying all over your kitchen or your toilet is overflowing is looking up reviews on which plumber you should call. So let me save you some time. Call the art of plumbing. They're always on time. They can locate the problem and fix it right away. They even help with solutions to stop any future problems. Save time. Call the art of plumbing today. 541-951-9405. Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I, of course, am your host, Neil Matthews. I'm so excited today. I get to sit down with a fellow runner, a man that uh, was just inspired to do something that was way out of his comfort zone. What do I mean by that? Well, I guess you're going to have to stay tuned next for my guest, Mitch from Run for God. You're not going to want to miss this amazing story and an amazing man. Hope you're ready for it because here we go. Hey, come take a walk with me. Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I, of course, am your host, Neil. And as you heard from the introduction, it is so great to sit with somebody across the country. Uh, it's not every day you get to talk to somebody from the great state of Georgia. Uh, I am not a fan of Georgia myself, but we'll get into that maybe a little bit later. But welcome in my guest. Back in the year 2007, a road race, a simple road race, sparks this amazing endeavor and we're going to talk about that just by wearing this shirt with with a funny stick guy on the front of it that says run for god from that going forward uh skipping ahead a couple of years back in uh 2010 my guest through his process begins a movement called run for god which involves a 12-week class teaching people how to connect not only with endurance but with their faith they currently have three devotionals out Uh, which can be purchased at runforgod.com under the tab shop, then educational. And uh, you can go there right now and and look at their material on runforgod.com. Welcome in my guest, Mitchell Hollis. Mitchell, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Neil? You know, as we we said, better than I deserve, which I truly do believe. So uh, we got to ask the most important question that you're probably going to answer, and that's this is, uh, what size shoes do you wear? I wear an 11 size shoe. Are you an 11? Now, do you I go am. up a little bit because of the running shoes, or, or are you just kind of stick with the 11? You, you know, growing up, I always wore a nine and a half, and I thought that's what I wore until I started running and got educated on how shoes should fit and realized that I was actually a size 11. So I, I've been wearing shoes too small my whole life. Are you kidding? Years. Wow. No, no. <laughs> so, uh, this is, this is, uh, this is so important to me. Shoes. Uh, I'm a, I'm a shoe guy myself. So, and a fellow runner. So, um, do you have a favorite brand that you're racing in or, or running in? I'm an Asics guy and it's, and it's not because it's my favorite brand. It's just because it's the shoe that has worked. I'm on probably my 18th or 20th pair now of the particular ones I, I run in and, and they work. So I, you know, if something works, I don't, I don't tend to mess with it, what, especially with shoes. What ASIC, uh, what ASIC line is it? It's the Jail Blur. It's the Jail Blur. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I race in uh, Noosa Speed 2. They're, they're racing flat, and they don't even make it anymore. So I'm like, when I go to a, racing, a new racing flat, I'm really kind of scared because I really yeah, love I, these so much, and you can't find them. So I'm really excited about that. But I'm an ASIC guy too, so I'm 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 thumbs upping you. You can't see it, but I but I am. I, I'm a big <laughs> ASIC fan. I was an Adidas guy in high school, and then a friend of mine actually bought me a pair of ASICs for Christmas one year, and I've been wearing those ever since. So awesome! Yeah, if you find something that works, don't it, don't try to change it. Yeah, especially as a runner, right? <clears throat> so Absolutely. how many pairs of shoes do you own? You you mentioned that you're on like would you say your 16th different pair or something like that? So so do you have a shoe collection of running shoes, much like I do? I, I don't. I mean, I'm probably like anybody else who runs. I have my, my running shoes, and then once they get three, 400 miles on them, they turn into my uh, runabout shoes where I just, you know, bang around during the day. And then once they get a little bit more wore out, they turn into my yard shoes. So 
Uh, they they go through a life cycle of, of running shoes all the way to, to yard shoes. Wow. And uh, then they finally hit the dumpster. Um, I hope my wife never hears this episode um, because she's going <laughs> to ask me what my problem is. I and, and this is no exaggeration. I probably have 50 pairs of shoes. Oh, wow. And most, yeah, yeah, most did, of uh, them are running yeah. shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's not me. That's, yeah. You know, maybe you can help me on that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we'll pray about that. Yeah, thank you. Please, <laughs> I might need to take like a minimalist class or something of that nature. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so Mitchell, help me out. T- take us back to the starting line of 2010, right? That January 2010, when things really started taking off for you guys. What What's the story behind it? Where did all this idea come from? You, you know, it, you look back, and I always say. Um, you know, people say that you should never look back. I'm of the mindset that you should. Um, you should look back to see where God had you and where he's brought you from. And uh, in the fall of 2009, it's kind of where it all started. It was in October of 2009. Um, I was at a church fellowship at our church. It was actually our homecoming. And at the time, I had been running for several years. I actually didn't start running too much later in life. And I had been running several years at the time. And and I had started getting into triathlon as well, and, and Ironman and half Ironman. And I was at this church fellowship, and I went and sat down by HR. HR is um, several years older than me. He actually taught me in RAs growing up in, in, a, in a former church when I was a young man. And I sat down with HR, and HR has been a lifelong runner himself. And so I sat down and I was just telling HR, you know, what I was going on in my life. I had, I had just finished my first half Ironman. I had just signed up for my first Ironman and my son Lane had actually just started into the sport. He was, I think six years old at the time and had just done his first, uh, kids triathlon. And I was just basically just pouring out everything that was going on in my life to HR and everything revolved around running and endurance sports and i i thought hr would appreciate this and um, i hadn't been talking very long and, and hr like i said who is a good friend of mine a deacon in our church he, he looked at me with this very concerned look on his face and, and very bluntly and boldly said mitch he said don't let this become your god and, and neil it just it hit me like a ton of bricks you know and it, it offended me at the time um i was i was upset by what he said because you know here i was trying to to talk about something good in my life and and here a deacon in my church was uh he was what i thought at the time you know meddling in my faith and so i left that that um homecoming i went home that night and i just couldn't get what hr said out of my head and i remember vividly the next few days it just I couldn't let it go. I was upset at HR. And I began to pray about it. And um, the Lord revealed to me very quickly that it it wasn't what HR said, um, but it was the fact that God was convicting me of something that I had put between him and I. And it was the sport of running. You know, most people think of idols as, you know, (laughs) as simple as something you put on your mantle. People have these misconceptions of what an idol is, but an idol is anything that you put between you and God. And for me, in the fall of 2009, that was the sport of running. You know, if I was if I was at church, I was thinking about the run after church, and and it began to consume me. And I I quickly realized um, through God's conviction that that I either had to give this sport up that I love, or I had to give it to God. And how do you give that to God? I mean, what does that really look like? You can't package the sport of running up and hand it over to God. And so I began to really struggle with, with how this was going to work. And so I decided that uh, one thing that I was not very good at doing was sharing what the Lord was doing in my life. I was very uh, private with that. You know, I've always said that, you know, your walk with Christ is a, is a, um, it's a, it's a, it is a private thing, but it's something that we should be um, sharing with other people. So I decided, you know, how, how could I do this? So I thought back several years, and I was sitting in church 
maybe around 2008. And I remember drawing a funny looking stick man on a piece of paper. And I wrote run for God over the top of it. And I just put it back in my Bible. And I, I don't know why looking back. I do know why looking back. But back then, I don't know why I did it. And I stuck it in my Bible. And I brought it on my desk. And when I started thinking about these T-shirts, my mind immediately went back two years to that funny looking stick man that I drew. So I come home and I pulled that file out of my drawer and I got that picture out. And it's not the picture that you see now. It's not the Run For God logo you see now. It was it was truly a stick man that I did on Microsoft Word or something. And so I put that on a T-shirt and I went to my local print shop and I had 12 T-shirts printed that said Run For God. And my thinking was that I would I would get these T-shirts made and I would start wearing them anytime I went to the gym or the pool or if I was out running, no matter where I was, I would wear these shirts. And I I knew that the the goofy looking nature of these shirts would would cause people to ask what is run for God. And I thought, well, this will force me outside my comfort zone to share what God's doing in my life. And so I had those 12 T-shirts printed, and the first stop I made was at HR and Adrian's house. And I I walked into HR's home, and I said, HR, I need to tell you something. I said, you really made me mad last weekend. (laughs) I said, but here is what God has done since then. And I remember HR, he broke down, and he was crying in his living room. And he looked at me. He said, Mitch, he said, I I didn't want to tell you that. That is that is not something that I wanted to say, but God was prompting me to say that. And because he, he had seen, he, he saw where I was and he also remembered where he was 20 years prior. He had been at the same place in his life with the sport of running and he had to take it to the altar. And so he saw that in somebody else. And, you know, I just thank God that he put me in front of HR that day. And so, Sure enough, I started wearing the T-shirts, and I started wearing them at the gym. I, I, my wardrobe immediately simplified in the fall of 2009. Um, I just getting started rid of running these shirts, t-shirts. right? Just getting rid of all those race shirts that you had collected through the years, too, right? It, exactly. I, I started wearing these Run for God shirts every day, and and I remember I was wearing them to church, and some people in my church began to come up to me and say, "Hey, Mitchell, you." you need to teach a running class at church. And my answer was very simple. It was no, (laughs) I'm not. I don't do that. (laughs) I don't do that. You're right. I I was a builder at the time. I'm in contracting and you know, my, where I, where my comfort zone is, is with a, with a hammer and nails. Which is not my comfort zone, by the way. (laughs) So, So, you know, and, and, and it didn't stop. You know, mm. more and more people began to come up to me and right. make this suggestion that I just thought was crazy. You know, I'm I'm not a Bible scholar. I've never been to seminary. I'm not even that great of a runner. <laughs> I don't believe that. If you're doing if you're doing Ironmans, if you're doing you know half Ironmans, you you you're you're pretty good. Come on now. Well, but I'm no Ron Hall. Well, that's, nobody that's, is. No, nobody's Steve Prefontaine either. Come on now. Exactly. Come exactly. on now. <laughs> but you know that's that's where that's, that's where, where we measure watching. ourselves, right? We measure exactly. ourselves by someone else, which is terrible. And so, yeah. And so I, I I remember making a phone call to my pastor, and I said, "Can I come see you this evening?" It, it was on a Wednesday night, and I I remember walking into his office, and I said, "Charlie, my pastor is Charlie Bridges," and uh, I made a comment to him. I said. You know, I started wearing these T-shirts, and I said, everybody in church keeps coming, not everybody, but lots of people keep coming up to me saying that I need to teach this running class, and I've never taught anything. I, I help in the RAs, but I've never taught anything in my life, and I was I was hoping that Charlie was going to let me off the hook. I, I was hoping <laughs> that Charlie was going to say, yeah, you know, you've never taught anything. You know, you might not ought to do this, it's but, probably just a bad idea, you know. Right. Yeah, okay. And Charlie very quickly said, I agree. That's not the answer <laughs> that I was looking for. Um, uh, so I, I, I said, okay, I'll, God, if this is what you want, I'll, I'll give it a shot. So I, I started to hang posters up in our church. This is about 
mid late October by this point, and I began to hang posters up in our church that said, "Run for God class coming this January." I think it was the fifth or something like that, the first Tuesday of 2010. And I said, run for God class, sign up in the church lobby. You know, like any good Baptist church does, you sign up in the lobby. Yeah, well, and, most churches now, but yeah, online. Well, yeah, most, per, so, most people are going online, but but yeah, go on. Yeah. So I, I, I put a sign-up form, and, you know, I, I put it out there, and I thought, nobody's going to sign up for this. Nobody. <laughs> and Because uh, so nobody before, runs for fun, right? That's, that's also what I'm well, thinking, too, right? I was right? marketing this as a class for people who had never run oh wow yeah you know this is going to be a true couch to 5k okay and so i put it out there and lo and behold we had 10 or 12 people sign up almost immediately and i thought oh this is really going to happen and um so i'll never forget it was sometime before christmas maybe middle december of 2009 i told my wife i said we probably need to go up to the to the local bible bookstore and we need to pick this program up because I knew, I knew, Neil, there is a program for everything. And I just knew that there was going to be a program for beginning runners and how to parallel that with your walk with Christ. I just knew it was there. I knew the Run for God program was already in store somewhere. In fact, I was, I was hanging this whole class on it. And so you so didn't have to I, make something or create something, right? Because exactly. you're thinking, not only am I going to teach a class, but now I'm going to be asked to create curriculum or, you know, study guides or whatever. That was nowhere on my radar. Okay. I thought, in fact, Holly and I, my wife, we got in the car one cold December day evening. I think it was on a Friday night. We drove to Chattanooga, Tennessee, to the to the the Bible bookstore up there and I started going down the aisles and I saw the Dave Ramsey's and the Beth Moore's and the Priscilla Shires. And I thought, wow, where's Lisa the running Turkhurst section? And yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just knew I was about to come to the running section and it wasn't there. And I thought, uh, no, we've got a problem. <laughs> we've got a problem now. Cause here I have, I've got people signed are, up. Are you freaking class. out at this point? Like, I, like, I am. like, I'm go, like, time. go with me in that. I'm going to go with you in that night. Like I'm, I'm staring at the shelf with you. Like you're, are well, you, I are you dumbfounded or are you just, what are you? Because I thought, well, I'll get online. There's something online. There right. is something online for this. And so I got online and couldn't find it. And I actually, um, had knew about a guy in Atlanta. He was the guy that his name was Richard Hopkins. He founded christian runners out of atlanta it's it's basically a running club um and it's it's basically believers who get together and they go run so i i thought well richard will know so i called richard and i said richard i need some help i'm, I'm starting this class here in a couple weeks. and it's it's a, a running class that running, you know fitness and faith and he said man it's not out here he said we've looked everywhere for something like that he said we would love to have it but there's nothing out there like that and this is where you start to have the real serious conversation you've put this desire in me you've confirmed this desire with my pastor and lots of other people around me you've had me put these sign up forms out we've got 10 or 12 people signed up and now you're not giving me the resources to carry through and, and that was a uh, that, that was my freak out point. You know, I thought I've never talked anything in my life. I do not like speaking in front of crowds. You know, if it's more than two people at the time, I just didn't talk. I, I didn't, that was not my comfort zone. And, um, I remember just having a little party with God saying, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I'll never forget. I just sat down and I, I started just coming up with things. Um, what, what are we going to do the first week? And so I had a plan for that first night where I was going to basically give my testimony up until this point, And I was going to ask everybody else, why are you here? And that was going to be the first night we were going to go out and run. And so I'll never forget that first night um, in January, I, I walked into the class and most of the people I knew, in fact, everybody I knew, it wound up being 14 people in that first class. And I stood up there 
petrified. I, I know that. I was terrified. But I, in, in fact, everything that I was going to say, I wrote down and I stood up there and I read it word for word. And then I looked up and I said, now I'm going to ask the question, why are you here? And I started to go around the room. And like I said, I had, I had presented this class to people, to people who had never run. I didn't want a bunch of runners in this class. I wanted people who had never run. And so I started to go around the room and I started to hear stories. And nearly it was almost like God just sat in on this room that night. And I started hearing about people's stories who were depressed. They were overweight. Their marriage was in shambles. Um, you know, they, they had run years ago in high school and got out of it and they were ashamed of where they were. And just all these reasons that just completely blew my mind. And I saw brokenness in people and they were coming to this class looking for some kind of hope. And it, and it really just, I mean, it, it really spoke to me that this is why we're here. This is this is what God was up to. Um, this is an avenue for people to not only get healthier physically, but to get healthy spiritually. And so over the next four or five weeks, um, we met every week, and I was I was coming up with this curriculum on a week by week basis. Um, uh, and I wasn't calling it curriculum at the time because this was the only class I was doing. I had already made it clear to God <laughs> when we get through this 12 weeks, I'm done. Uh, I will have <laughs> done my part and I'm going back to building and I just, you know, this is, this is going to be fun, but this is going to be it. Little did you know you're actually building something, right? Exactly. And and about five weeks into it, uh, our church secretary called me. I was actually on a job site and our church secretary called me and she said, Mitchell, one of the, the churches down the road has called and they want to know where they can get this curriculum. They've they've heard about what's going on over here and their church wants to do it. How are you feeling at that point? <laughs> I said, well, I kind of laughed. I said, let me call. It was actually a friend of mine. I knew the guy who was calling. He was another runner. Yeah. In another church. So I called him and I said, Jason, I said, you know, I hate to tell you, but this, there is no curriculum. This is a stack of notebook paper on my desk. We're doing one <laughs> class at Grove Level and when we're done, we're done. And he said, oh, okay. And so it, it wasn't just a few days later and the church secretary calls me again. She said, another church down the road is called and they've heard about what's going on at Grove Level and, and they want to do this. And this happened three or four different times. And, um, so you're not swinging I'm, a hammer anymore, I'm guessing, right? Well, no, I am still at this point. Okay, I'm, all right. I'm just dismissing all these people. I'm just no, it's we're done. Sorry. We're done. I don't sorry, know what you've heard, but, yeah, you we're know. we're done. It's an exclusive I club. This sorry, is over. Exactly. yeah, we're we're done. <laughs> tap and tap, I'll, I'm out. I'll never forget. I was at church on Wednesday night, and I was one of my my buddies and I actually the guy that I helped teach RAs with. We were in RAs, and I was I was kind of joking with him about it. I said, you know, people are calling and they're wanting to start this class and I'm having to tell everybody it's just a stack of notebook paper. Sorry. And this guy looked at me and, and to this day, this gentleman uh, will not exercise. And he's very vocal that exercise is bad for you uh, in a joking way, but he's one of my great friends. And I'll never forget Jerry looking at me. He said, you're going to have to publish this. And I said, Jerry, you're, you're crazy. You know, this, that's not going to happen. And, um, uh, I'll never forget there again over the next few days, God just began to take the word of somebody else and just pierced my heart with them. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing all the things like I'm no Ryan Hall. Um, I'm no, I'm not an evangelist. I've never been to seminary. I've never, I've ne I'm not, I'm not, I can't, I can't, I can't. And the continuous thing that God kept saying to me is you're right. You can't, but I can. Mitch, that's, I remember I, that, that's so incredible that you just continue to stay faithful, even in the doubt, to do this, though, right? Yeah, yeah. And and, and there again, I, I found myself, this time I didn't go to my pastor's office. I asked him and his wife to come over to our house for dinner one night. And I thought, you know, Charlie is really going to shoot this one down. You know, there's 
there's no way he's going to let me do this. So I began to tell him and his wife over dinner what, what had been going on these now six or seven weeks and how the class was going. And, and then about all these people who were wanting me to write this program and that I just kept dismissing them. And, and again, once again, I was looking for an out. I was looking for Charlie to say, yeah, you know, it's probably not a good idea to, to write something and publish it because you, you really don't have a platform. You, you're not that great of a runner. You're not a pastor. You're, I, I was looking for that. And once again, Charlie said, I agree. You should do that. It's time to find a new church, by the way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and I'm kidding, of course. Yeah, so, I, you know, the, the next morning, I remember going to bed that night thinking, Lord, you know, if this is what you want, make it easy. And um, I remember getting up the next morning, and uh, 9 o'clock, I just picked up the phone, and, and there's a particular um, – Bible bookstore. It's it's basically the only one I knew of at the time. It's the only Christian publisher that I knew of at the time. And I thought, you know, if this is what God wants, we're going to put it to the test right here. And so I, I never forget, I, I called this Christian publisher and I called the 1-800 number, you know, that you would find on a website. And, and I'll never forget the guy I got on the other end of the line. His name was John. And, um, uh, I started telling John this crazy story, this crazy eight weeks or so and what had taken place. And and I remember John, I could hear him typing on his computer. I could physically hear, he must have one of those loud keyboards. And, and I remember John was just typing. And I remember the whole time I was talking, thinking, this guy's not listening to a word I'm saying. He's letting me tell my story as a courtesy. And then he's going to say at the end, you know, we're not interested in, that'll be that and that'll be the close of this chapter and looking back i know now what john was doing john was searching john was searching for a run for god program the same run for god program that i thought was already there (laughs) which he couldn't even find so he began to look and search and and neil this is if i'm lying i'm dying as a good friend pastor of mine would say within two hours we had a book deal. Wow. And it, it's like God just, he heard the prayer of a, of a guy who was really struggling at this point with where he's at in his face. I mean, my faith was really being tested in these days. And I said, my prayer to God was make it easy. Don't, don't give me signs. Give me billboards. Yeah. And that was a billboard. Yeah, I mean, it was. From, Especially Everything a two-hour book now, deal, no, but not, that doesn't happen, right? I mean, that exactly. that doesn't happen. It, it doesn't. Yeah. And um, so, so he he gave me a lot of things I needed to do. I remember I I called my brother, who is my business partner in our construction business, and I said, I need to take some time off. I said, I've just gotten a book deal. <laughs> and I remember <laughs> my brother almost started laughing. He was like, "What?" Yeah. I said. It's crazy, and I, but there's a lot of things that I have to do. I have to get done. I have to finish writing this thing, number one. I, I was eight weeks into it. I wasn't even done with it. Right. And so I got to work, and, and the, the class, I'll never forget going to tell them the class, and they were just elated. I mean, they, they had been on this journey from day one with me, and, and a lot of these people are still my greatest friends. Actually, a few of them actually work for us now, and, and so I got to work, and I started doing everything that I had to do to to make this deal work. And, and in July of 2010, uh, we had a printed, published uh, Bible study that was nice and polished. And, and, and I got to pick up the phone, and I got to call those 16 churches who had reached out to me just months before. And I had dismissed them, and I said, hey— you know that program you you called me about we now have it and so in july of 2010 uh, 17 churches including ours in dalton georgia started the 5k challenge together we all met at our own churches and then on certain nights we would come together like there's a particular night where we talk about shoes at the time that was week three and we all came together 
at our church to have, and we had our local running store come down and talk about shoes. We had 600 people packing our church to hear about God and shoes. It's like a and dream come true of mine. <laughs> or your worst nightmare. I mean, for no, me, I, just, like for me, it's a dream come true. Like two of my favorite, well, three of my exactly. favorite things, God, shoes, and running, you know? <laughs> well, and I'll never forget, you know, that first class was 14. We had 22 graduate. And right. in the second class, this is when all the momentum was going around town. I mean, you could not go down the road in our hometown without seeing somebody running in a Run for God shirt. And so I, I started advertising that second class. And I, you know, we had like 60 something people signed up on the forum and, and I'm freaking out because I had just gotten used to talking to 14 or 21 people. And now we've got triple that signed up. And I'll never forget, we had 67 or 68 registered that first night and 200 showed up Wow! Well, to my I, class. And I, I remember thinking, I can't do this. I I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I remember a few of the deacons at my church, they took me in the bathroom and were praying over me Amen. because I was, I was really just not comfortable. But there again, God just sat in on that place. And, and I remember in 2010 thinking, wow, we've got 16, 17 churches doing this. This can, I don't see how it could ever get any bigger than this. And that was 10 years ago. And today we're in just over 4,500 churches around the world. And, and it's just a testament to, I had my plan, but God had different plans. I, and I think that is an amazing, just an amazing story, Mitch. Thanks for sharing that with us. So I, I got to ask you, because I keep hearing this phrase from you guys, and it's this phrase of... <clears throat> Why is it why is it so hard or why is it so important to say so long to our comfort zone? And you've kind of hit on that a little bit, but why is that so important to you? Ask that question again. I'm not sure I understood that. Yeah. Sorry about that. So so why is saying so long to my comfort zone so important? Because I'm convinced that we don't grow while we're in our comfort zone. You know, for the past ten years, I have not been in my comfort zone it started you know I, I talk about you know what i just said earlier about you know sometimes we've got to look back to see where we've been so that we can kind of tell where god is is taking us um god expands our comfort zone a little bit at a time and, and I, I say i can see that now because looking back w what if god would have told me when, when hr confronted me what if God would have given me the vision right then that, Mitchell, I want you to get some T-shirts printed, and then I want you to teach a class in your church, and then I want you to write a running program, and then I want you to expand that to 16 churches, and then I want you to, to quit your job. I want your wife to quit her job. I want you to go full-time into this. I want you doing public speaking, and I want you to grow this ministry around the world. If God would have given me that vision in the fall of 2009, I would have said so long. It's not going to happen. But God constantly, you know, he started with, Mitchell, get 12 t-shirts made. Okay, so I did that, and I got comfortable. And then God gave me the next task. You know, teach, teach this one class. It's just 14 people. Okay, I'll do that. You know, just make a phone call to see if something might happen with this. Okay, I did that. And, and, it, and it's been that way, and it's, it's, it's that way all the way to today. You know, we're, we're in the process, uh, I guess by the time everybody is hearing this, we're releasing volume four of the 5K challenge. You know, just a couple years ago, we, we completely rewrote the program to present the gospel. You know, when we, when we initially wrote the program, as we just got done talking about, it, it was for 14 people at my church. There was no evangelism needed in it. It was for people in my church. But through the years, we've heard feedback from so many instructors around the country, around the world, that 20, 30, 40 percent of the Run for God classes at any given church are made up 
of 20, 30 to 40 percent people who are not churched. They're coming to learn that, how to That's run. crazy. Give that stat again, would you mind? That last stat. Anywhere from, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of the typical run for God class is made up of people who are unchurched. And, and I think that is so important, especially with churches. Uh, I, I'm going to give you a little background, Mitch, on, on where, I, where you and I cross paths. So um, I'm an avid runner, as I've told you kind of in our emails pre-show. Um, yeah. I, uh, I've run to date now over 55 K's. I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a triathlete like you are, but, um, I'm not in a 10 K, uh, you know, like once a year, twice a year sometimes, but I'm a 5 K runner and my 5 K right. time is, you know, anywhere between, you know, on a great training, you know, uh, circle or uh, cycle, you know, I'm a 26 minute 5 K runner on a bad right. training cycle. I'm probably about a 32, you know, so yeah. depending on how much training I get in. Right. But, for me, you know, I had a very similar story that you, that you had with HR, and that's a guy in my church, and I'm going to name him right now. His name's Bob. He's our worship leader. He's also our community pastor. And Bob says to me, he says, hey, have you, have you checked out this Run for God site on Facebook? I'm like, yeah, I'll look at it. And so I kind of look it over, and I'm like, you know, I don't know. It's not for me. It's not for our church. And he goes, I really think you should, you know— you know, get into this and find out what it would take to do a class on this run for God thing. And I'm like, no one in church is going to come and run. Nobody wants to do that, right? Sounds familiar. Right? That That's why I'm so excited to tell you this story. So I'm like, I kind of just put it on the back burner, just kind of just throw it in the, you know, in the we'll look at later kind of pile. I know you probably have those too, right? So yeah, I then start this podcast, and we're going along and things are going good and, and we're interviewing a lot of my friends, a lot of my, you know, fellow coworkers and, and things like that. And and for whatever reason, you kind of kept popping up into my mind. Not you specifically, but run for God. And I'm like, man, who can I get on my show that's passionate about what I'm passionate about, which is running, passionate about God, which I'm passionate about, and how can I get those two worlds to kind of collide? And I thought I wonder if they'd sit down and do an interview with me. I'm like, I don't even know who to talk to. I don't even know who to speak to. So I literally went to your site, threw out some random email that, you know, probably, you know, somehow got to you. I don't know how that works, but it got to you. And I got to be honest with you, and, and Garrett can attest to this. Of course, he's not on air, so he, he's going to just nod his head. But I was so excited, like almost nervous to sit and talk to you today because I'm so excited about the fact that just a casual conversation and now hearing your story of how Run For God started is so similar to this conversation of how this podcast started even with me with a casual conversation of my wife saying, now full circle, you should start a podcast, honey. You need a verbal outlet because um, you need to get some of your thoughts out there to the world. <laughs> and now I think yeah. she's regretting that. But, love you, honey. <laughs> but but my whole thing is is, is when I... When you agreed to this, I was so excited and could not wait to finally sit with you to the point because I think for so many people, running is hard. And why do you think running is so hard for people? It, it just takes everything that we're not designed to do to do it. The determination, the discipline, the fortitude, the, the, the exact same thing that it takes to be a follower of Christ, it takes to do the sport of running. And that's, that's why they parallel so well. Um, you know, part of the, the, the hardest part about running is getting out the door and taking that first step. The hardest part about reading your Bible every day is opening the book. Um, and so I, 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 we're just not designed that way. As humans, we're, we're fallible. We're not designed to have the discipline. It, it takes work. To do that, just like it takes work to have a closer, more edifying relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not easy, but Christ never said it was going to be easy. In fact, he said, pick up your cross and follow me. That is that is not a that is not an enjoyable picture. It's it's a it's a sacrifice to do that. But we're called to do that. And that's why I think that, you know, if 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 you're a, a great follower of Christ and you've already got those qualities and you can be a successful runner 
or if you're a successful runner, then you've already got the qualities that it takes and the, the discipline that it takes to be a, a, a great follower of Christ. So I think, I think that's why, you know, our, 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 our kind of our flagship verse is, is Hebrews 12 one. It's, it's laying aside all the distractions and today more than ever, we've got so many distractions uh, we've got social media. We've got our kids. We've got uh, ball games. We, I mean, we just cram our schedules in a way that, that, that gives us the excuse to say, well, I just didn't have time. I didn't have time to go run today. I didn't have time to read my Bible today. Well, that's, that's the picking up our cross part, you know, laying aside all those things that are distractions, making the time, even if you got to put it in your calendar. You know, we're so calendar driven nowadays. Put it in your calendar, 8 to 8.30 every morning or 6 to 6.30 every morning. I'm sitting down and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get along with Christ. And it's the same thing with our workouts. You know, the, the biggest excuse that we have for people not being able to run or saying that they can't fit a physical activity into the day is they don't have time. Um, and, and I know many people talk about this, but it's so true. You know, we've just we've, we've crammed our lives with so much stuff. Um, and that's that's the devil's way of, of crowding God out, uh, and and the things that make us healthy out, and the things that edify us. It's 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 his way of crowding those things out. I don't know if that really answered. Your no, question. I, I I think it did. I think it answered it, it, it amazingly well. Um, why is perseverance such an important part of your story, or how is perseverance such an important part of your story? You know, I think anything that we do that we want to be successful at, um, you know, that I was saying anything worth doing is not easy. And anything that is not easy, it takes perseverance. It You're going to have setbacks. You know, I coach a triathlon team, a junior triathlon team, and, and – we have some kids on our team who are, are nationally ranked. We basically got one young man who, who's ranked fifth in the nation right now. And at that level, I, I see so many um, fallacies, especially, especially with young people and, and their identity is you know, they're, they're, they're hanging their hat on. I'm a triathlete. And, and, and before long they make that, and, and then when, you know, they have a bad race or they get an injury, their world comes tumbling down. And it's because they've, they've put their, their hope, they've put their identity in something that is, in reality, it's what they do. You know, we are, you know, I'm a triathlete, I'm a runner, <laughs> uh, I'm a child of God, that's who I am. That's why I'm so excited about the, the Kendrick Brothers new movie that's actually coming out tomorrow, Overcomer. Uh, which is a cross country movie. I cannot and, wait to uh, see that movie. By the way, when I saw yeah. the preview for that, I love all their movies. First off, and when I saw oh, the, 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 the the preview it's... for that, I was like, I'm begging my wife. I'm like, honey, can can we go? Can we go? Can we go? And she's like, yeah, yeah. But you know, Spider Man's pretty good, honey. I'm like, yeah, but this movie's <laughs> about cross country. Yeah, I've had the, I've had the honor of I've seen it twice now already. I'm I'm a little jealous, I mean, a little envious right they, now. And the they, fact that they they've do, partnered they. with you too on a lot of respects, I'm a little envious of that as well. So I don't know yeah. if you can maybe get me a, an audience with them perhaps. Well, Just it was kidding. a huge honor. Um, but, but yeah, and, and I think I might have got sidetracked. There, That's okay. The, the whole identity. And, and I guess at the end of the day, you, you asked the question, why is perseverance so important? I think it's yeah. important in every aspect of our life. And – our society today does not teach that. Our society today teaches many times if it's too hard, do something else, and and that's that's not that's not what that's not that is not biblical. Number one, um, but number two, that's just that's not what we're to do. You know, we're supposed to perseverance goes to that to that quote that Jesus makes: "Pick up your cross." daily and follow me that that is the definition of perseverance and endurance and and getting up every day and putting on your shoes and and going into your prayer closet getting along with god that takes perseverance um it's not easy god never said it was going to be easy but it's going to be worth it so I, i got kind of a silly question for you um 
Are you are you a big music guy when you, when you're when you're working out or you're running? Are you a big music guy? You know, I'm not. I I, I typically nowadays I do my runs. Uh, I, I run far less than I used to, um, but I do most of my runs, especially this time of year, um, before our athletes uh, come to practice. So, okay. So uh, Dean and I, Dean Thompson, who who you've probably seen, he works with us. He writes some with us, and uh, Dean and I both coach coach this uh, triathlon team. We also coach coach a couple cross country teams around, and so usually I'll show up to practice and I'll I'll do my runs before them. So unfortunately, I, I'll leave this podcast right here and I'll I'll go run get my run in before they're running at four o'clock. Okay. So I'm running in the heat of the day right now. So, yeah, you are. Uh, yeah. So I, I just was curious is is if there's any music that inspires you while you're running. That's why I was asking. So, you know, I, I I'm not a big music guy when I'm running. Um, I have listened to some some podcast and, and there's a really like good that. one I've heard about. Yeah, that's what I hear. <laughs> uh, other people's shoes. Yeah. And, uh, but Thank yeah, I, I'm I'm not a, I'm not a big music guy. I like to uh, you know, especially if I'm running on trails, I like to just unplug and. You know, because you're, you're probably like me. You're tied to a phone or a computer all day. Yes. So I like to kind of get technology free mm. and just and just go out and enjoy myself. And you know, it, it a lot of times it turns into prayer time. Yeah. Um, you can really you can really do some great praying while you're running. And a lot of times it's God get me through this. Yes. Uh, it's Amen. 95 to that. degrees in <laughs> North Georgia right now, and 100 percent humidity. Why That's am I out here? Why am I out here? Yeah, we don't get that hot here in Oregon, uh, yeah. thankfully. So, yeah. um, well, Mitch, I want to kind of, I want to kind of uh, pick your brain a little bit here, if you can. Um, this quote, I know it, it kind of means something to you, and I, I just want to kind of get your your further thoughts on it. It's uh, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. Why does that resonate so much with you? We we'll use that quote, and I've heard that quote attributed to several different people i don't know who actually made that quote i've seen several names attached to it but we we use that quote a lot because um with endurance sports and and running falls into endurance sports uh half or more is mental and if if you walk up to a line if if you're if 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 you're going to a 5k and and you've kind of hung that goal of let's say 26 minutes you're gonna run this 5k 26 minutes and you've kind of had that on your mirror written for two months and you've been training for it and you step up to the line and for whatever reason you say that day i can't i don't i don't think i can do that then it's a very good chance that you're not going to be able to do that Um, but if you step up to that line and you say i can do this then there's a very good chance that you are going to do it now within reason uh, but we tell our kids this all the time because, you know, young people especially, they're so wired that they, they'll they come into a practice, you know, having been to school or, or whatever the, the day may have held before they get to practice. And you can just see their attitude. Or, or I've been in, in Run for God classes where I know that we're going to be running after. And I can see in these adults' faces that they've had a hard day at work. They're just tired. And, and the mental side of things is, is so big in our sport. Um, and, and that quote is right. I think Bobby Bowden's the one that I've heard say it through, or heard it attributed to the most. And and whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're probably right. It's, it's basically just saying what it just says. If you think you can't do something, it's a very good chance you're not going to be able to do it. But if if you think you can, then you've got half the battle fault because half the battle of endurance sports is in your mind. You know, you've always you've always heard that a you know, the halfway point or the mile 20 of a marathon is the halfway point. Well, they're, they're saying that not because of the physical aspect. They're saying that because of the mental aspect. Mile 20 is when you start to hit the wall. That's when your glycogens and your sodium and everything starts to run out. And you start seeing triple of everything. And, and your mind starts to tell you, I can't do this. I'm 20 miles in. I, I can't do this. And a lot of people they'll stop and walk. The 20 mile point is when you see so many people in a marathon stop and walk. And it's not because they can't physically do it. It's because their mind has won the battle and said, I can't do this. And if you can, if you can train your mind, we talk to our young people so much about training the mind, you know, 
the, the only way to, to know how far you can go is to go. You know, we, we work with our kids on pushing them to a breaking point. And I don't mean physically breaking, but to a breaking point so they know where that line is. And then they can train to, to move that line further and further. So, yeah, I mean, we do use that quote a lot because in, in our in our sport, um, the mental side is half the battle. I think that's great. Uh, we had a coach when I was running. I ran two years of cross country and then three years of track in high school. I wasn't good enough to go on to collegiates, but that's okay. No, no, yeah. no, no regret there. But uh, we had a coach that if you walked during a workout, you did the workout again because <laughs> there was no walking. There just yeah. wasn't. Yeah. And so we would do mile repeats. And if he caught you walking, you know, like I said, you had, you had to do it again. So as a runner now, you know, as an adult runner post high school, if I walk in a race, like I'm defeated. Like, I'm just like, I, I can't even like look at my wife or anyone in the face afterwards. They're like, how was the race? I'm like, I walked. They're like, why'd you walk? Don't I'm like, me. I didn't train. I didn't train really well. But I think that's so important that training really does go into so much of, of, of racing but even if you're not a competitive runner, training in general, when things are hard, pushing through, I mean, those are those are lessons that that can only really be learned when you're out running, in my opinion. And, and I think you'd you'd agree with that. Well, it's funny. It's funny you use that quote because I just flipped open to our 5K challenge. Because I knew that quote was in this book. It's actually in week eight, and the reason I put that in week eight, week eight is is and actually it's attributed to Henry Ford in here uh, on week eight. But week eight is where our program goes from walking slash running to running. Now, let me give you week seven's workout. Week seven is uh, you jog five minutes, you walk three, you jog five, you walk three, and you jog five. So you've you've jogged or ran for 15 minutes with a few short walking breaks. Week eight is a big week. Uh, in our class it's where we we rally everybody together we get people out cheering for these people because week eight all the walking breaks are gone yeah. and you go out and you you do a five minute warm-up walk and you run for 20 minutes wow now I'll, I'll i'll tell you the comments that i get every time i've taught this class on the night the first night of week eight the comment is i can't run for 20 minutes just last week we were only running for five minutes. Well, well, think about what they're saying there. Think about what they're doing in themselves, number one. Week seven, yes, they ran for five-minute segments. They ran for 15 minutes the week before. Right. All we're asking them to do is to go 20. And so week eight, we really talk about this quote. You know, if you're, if you're sitting in here and you're having a pity party and you're saying, I can't do it, then you're probably right. But I know that you can. I know physiologically we've done this enough that your body can do this. Your body will respond to this, and it will make it happen so long as your mind don't get in the way. And week eight is so cool because these people who've come into this class from all different backgrounds, everybody's wine is different. They they finish that 20-minute run, and they're in tears. Because, yes, they've broken through something physically, but more importantly, they've broken through something mentally. Absolutely. They came into that class saying, I cannot do this. And that's why we encourage the instructors to, this is where you bring in your runners and your family. You know, you got people out there with posters. This is almost as big as their first 5K. Wow. Because this is such a milestone. And, and it's it's that's why we have that quote in week eight is because – if you can win the battle in your mind, you can do so much physically. I think that's such a valuable takeaway. You know, if you could win the battle in your mind, you can do so much more physically. That That's powerful to me. So, so uh, Mitch, I want to close, give you one last opportunity to really talk about this, this new curriculum that's coming out. How can people get excited about it and get behind it? Well, again, um, we're, we're really stretching outside of our comfort zone, uh, volume four is releasing or, or by the time this airs already has released it's in pre-sale at the, at the moment uh, but week four is just all new content uh, the actual uh, running side of it is the same uh, we're actually going to be uh, venturing out into a spanish version uh, we're we're in the process of rewriting a 10k to marathon challenge as well as a 5k challenge for kids um, so 
So we're really making a push. Like I said, we're in a little over 4,500 churches at this point, but God has really laid it on our hearts that um, this program is solid. It, it is bringing, we've had hundreds of people come to know Christ through this program, um, which is just incredible uh, that God can speak to people through the pages of a running program and, and bring them to the foot of the cross. And it is because we clearly present the gospel in chapter 10 of the 5K challenge. Uh, there's there's no question what that chapter is about. We don't even talk about running in chapter 10. It's all about the gospel um, because we do have those 20 to 40 percent of people who are in church. So so we're really making an effort this fall uh, to to take this ministry to a much bigger platform. We feel that God has, has brought us to this point. He's prepared us um, infrastructurally to, to take it to the next level, and, and we're going to give it our, our best to do just that in an effort to see more people uh, get healthy and come to know Christ. I, I think that's powerful. One of my life verses, and if not the life verse of my life that govern that has governed and continues to govern much of my life, and and that's this Acts twenty twenty four, which says, "I consider my life worth nothing to me, if I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus give, has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel." And I think you guys are are totally doing that, obviously, in what you're doing and and those efforts. And man, I am just as I said, I was so nervous and thrilled and excited, all of these emotions wrapped up into one box all at the same time to talk to you. And I know you're just a dude just like me that just loves Absolutely. running and loves Jesus and loves your wife and loves your kids. I know that. But but at the end of the day, to, to give you an opportunity and to kind of cross platforms between your platform and my platform to really share what God's doing in your life, man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just appreciative of that. So thank you so much for, for what you've given us today. We do play a game at the end of my show, so we'll kind of wrap up with, with just this idea, Mitch, and I, and I just want to give you again one last opportunity. Why should someone do a class for Run for God in their church if they're not already? Why should they do it? Yeah, if you're if you're where I was 10 years ago, I was I was a run. I was a follower of Christ. I was looking for my mission field, even though I didn't know it at the time. Um, there, there are roughly 60 million runners in this country, and that's a that's a big mission field. So if if you're out there today and you're listening to this and you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're a runner, you are the perfect instructor. And I, I think that's great. Yeah. I do. I think that's great so much. So, uh, so Mitch, thanks again. Uh, as I said, we're going to play a game with you. I know it's going to be kind of weird because we're – doing a game remotely, but we play this game called Senseless, so uh, I'm going to roll a die on your behalf. By the way, it is in a North Carolina blue cup, so could you give me a go heels, maybe? Go uh, heels. Okay. I know that was painful. That was painful for you, wasn't it? I can give you a go dogs. Better. You can give me a go dogs? Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I guess I'll let that slide. <laughs> At least we're not in the same conference. So uh, you rolled a number three, yeah. which is uh, one of my favorite questions. Uh, what is your favorite thing to smell? My favorite thing to smell? Fresh cut grass. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Nope. Between the hedges or, or just in general? No, in general. <laughs> okay. I love the smell of fresh cut grass. Wow. That's awesome. I mean, you know, everybody's yeah. got their things. So, uh <laughs> I'm I'm appreciative of that. Uh, you can come mow my grass anytime because that is the worst chore <laughs> I have probably in the house. I will do dishes. Really? I will do dishes before I go mow the grass. Does that give you any See, hint? Mowing, mowing the grass is therapy for me. Is it? Oh, oh, you're absolutely. one of those? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, there again, I don't have to have a screen or a phone. I can't have either one of those while I'm cutting grass. So it's, oh. it's a good time to disconnect. Yeah, good for you. Uh, Mitch, thanks again for doing this, man. I, I really appreciate it. This of course has been other people's shoes. And, uh, I just want to remind everybody, I want to thank my guests again for run for God guys, go check out his stuff again, runforgod.com. Uh, great place to go check out their resources. If you're a church in the area hearing this, or even a church nationwide, I strongly recommend looking into their program, seeing how your church can implement it. If you have questions, they have the answers, essentially, of, of how to get this implemented into your church and how to get people fired up about it. Uh, they've walked through this a, a number of times. 
uh mitch came on with with no uh with no monetary thing like we're not trading things here he's just a great guy and i'm a fan of his and a fan of what they're doing so please go be a part of of what they're doing and spreading the gospel and see how run for god can work in your not only your community but your church community as well and again i just want to remind everybody when you walk in other people's shoes you really do get a different perspective on life i want to thank my guest from run for god mitch thank you so much for doing this i appreciate it man so much for the opportunity neil absolutely my pleasure Thank you so much for joining us on Other People's Shoes. I don't know about you, but today's takeaway was pretty impactful. The idea of Mitch describing the 20 minute run was fascinating to me. I just, I gotta be honest. I know some of you out there are like 20 minutes. Are you kidding me, Neil? I could never do that. Just an idea for you. Maybe take the Run For God course and see if you can push yourself past that comfort zone in this next year. Maybe make that your goal. Just an idea for you. Hey, we're doing a giveaway this October and we want you to be a part of it. So here's Tracy Maxfield to tell you a little bit about her book. Hi, I'm Tracy Maxfield and I was on podcast Other People's Shoes a couple of weeks ago talking about depression and my journey from the rabbit hole. In fact, I wrote a book, Escaping the Rabbit Hole, My Journey Through Depression. I have given a signed copy of my book that they can give away. I hope you enjoy my book. That's right. We are giving away a book. So if you'd like to be a part of that, of course, like us over on Facebook and comment down below why you'd like to get your one copy of this book. Of course, you can also follow us on Instagram for an entry, hashtag escaping the rabbit hole. You can do the same thing on Twitter, hashtag escaping the rabbit hole at people's shoes. So there you go. There's some entries. And of course, a fourth entry, if you'd like, you can give us a rating on iTunes. So next week, we're going to have a president on and another fellow runner. So two pairs of shoes at the same time. Yet again, we do like to do that every now and then. So hopefully you can stay tuned next Wednesday for that. What? We're going to have a president on? Do I need to dress up? Oh my gosh, I got to go get ready. Can't wait till next Wednesday. Hopefully I'll be ready and I know you will be as well. Join us next week on Other People's Shoes. Thank you so much.